Pierre, thanks a lot for joining me today. I'm really flattered that so many of you came here to listen to me. So, yeah, let's start. Um, the topic today is architecture components, and the title also includes Kotlin. Um, I guess it was more like a disclaimer. I'm using Kotlin for a long time now, and you really cannot expect me to write a single line of Java anymore. So that's why all our code examples today will be in Kotlin, but I guess it won't be a problem because we saw a lot of Kotlin already on this conference. Um, yeah, uh, who am I? I think uh, I was pro already properly introduced. Um, so yeah, that's, it's, it's another t uh, talk about Android architecture, and we had a lot of these already. This. Uh, on the Stroid con, so it seems to be a very important issue to us. And why is that? Because I guess you uh, can agree that we all want to write high quality code that is maintainable, that is clean, that is readable. And uh, archi the architecture, of course, is the basis to all of that. So let's start off with a little question. How do you actually measure high quality code? Anyone? Okay, so like code reviews, and if a colleague says it's good, it's good, yeah. You might think of static code analysis maybe, but I think the only real measurement of high quality code is this. It's WTFs per minute. So uh, when I started um, uh, developing Android, um, there was an Android project and I never did Android and I thought how can I uh, get into it. So I looked up some sources and I ended up with a book. And after I read it I just dived into it and tried to apply some MVC-ish pattern that I uh, took away from my, my previous projects. And in the end I ended up with something that had very huge activities. So like MVC is like put everything in the activity and my, uh, my actual architecture maybe looked something like this. So I was looking in options how to improve it and again I came up with, with some libraries. There are a lot of libraries and they were there for a long time that do some code generation, reduce your boilerplate code, make your life easier. So. Um, in the end, I maybe came up with something that looked like this. It was still not ideal, but at least um, the direction was clear. And finally, um, I tried an MVP, MVP approach, which was probably the first, um, the first architecture that was um, for the Android platform and it already worked quite well. So you, you, can really, uh, you can really work well with it and I think mo uh, a lot of people of you still work with MVP. But I think it still has its rough edges. So what I ended up eventually is MVVM and currently I'm uh, feeling quite comfortable with that. Um, but it took me a long time to uh, go through all these iterations. It were some years and all the while Google, what Google had to say about how an Android app architecture should look like was this. Until uh, this year's Google I.O. So in this year's Google I.O. they finally um, released a guide on how an Android architecture should look like. So let's look at it uh, at quickly, what Google suggests. So you still have your activity and fragment as a kind of uh, root of all evil, you would say. And they say you should um, put as, uh, you, you should keep it as lean as possible. So you still need it to uh, create your view, uh, to wire up your components, but you shouldn't really do um, any business logic there if possible. Instead, um, yeah, of course, um, you also create your view here, and your view has to be filled is there to be filled with data, right? But you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't use the activity or fragment to fetch this data, but instead you should uh, feed your view from a model, a view model, and 
Yeah, it's there, as I said, for the view to pull the data out of the view model and also to push events to the view model that again changes the data. And the view model, um, you, you don't want to uh, put too much uh, code in the view model as well, of course. So normally you would have um, several data sources and what sh uh, you should do is use a repository pattern to just uh, act as a kind of a mediator between your data sources which in the end might be a web service, uh, your uh, SQL da light database or even an in-memory cache. Um, yeah, and in most of the cases you might have uh, all three of those so you really need some, some layer that abstracts this away from the view model. Um, uh, yes, so if we look at this, I mean this is uh, basically just an MVVM so it's really nothing new to us. But it wasn't the only thing Google released in this uh, year's I.O. but they also introduced architecture components. So this is a set there are uh, of small uh, APIs, libraries and they help you to circumvent certain difficulties in Android architecture. Um, one of those is Room. I won't cover this, uh, cover Room in this talk. We already had a great talk yesterday about it, I think. And uh, it's also way off in the data layer, so I will concentrate on the other three instead. Um, yes, let's start with the view model. So to understand um, the target of the view model, I would just have a quick look at the at an activity lifecycle. So what normally, uh, what all of our applications do, we have an activity and you create this activity and eventually you get a configuration change like your user will rotate the device. So what happens now is you, your activity is destroyed so you run through on, on pause, on stop, on destroy and a new instance of an activity is created. And now it starts all over again, so we run again through on create, on start and on resume. And eventually um, the user will finish the activity, so maybe um, exit your application or whatever and you run through the destruction again and your activity is gone for good. So when we used uh, M MVVM approach before, our view model had the same lifetime as our activity instance. And this has some issues of course which you might all know. So when the activity is recreated uh, uh, and your view model is recreated, you have to save your state before the destruction, you have to restore your state after the destruction. You might have long running tasks that are not finished yet and um, if the model view model is recreated, you might have to restart these tasks which you really don't want to do because you don't want to lose the time you already spent there. And what the activity components view, uh, view model does for us is that their life cycle is extended to the whole life of the activity until it is finally destroyed. And how it is achieved in the background, it's, it's just a fragment with a retain instance state set to true. So it will actually survive all the, um, all the configuration changes and it will be destroyed with the, with the activity when it's finished. Okay, so let's just, uh, I, I prepared some code snippets. Let's just look at what it is. So, I have a very, um, uh, highly innovative app here, which is one that triggers the GitHub API. I guess you will never have seen such a sample before. And when I type my, uh, my, when I, yeah, when I type something, then it's uh, searching for a GitHub user, basically. Okay. 
that's it for the demo, just so you know what we are talking about. So let's just quickly start off with the activity, what the activity does. Um, we just have this GitHub activity and first we start off by instantiating an injector. And a dependency injection for me is a really important thing. You should definitely always uh, have some dependency injection solution in place to, to um, put your instances together. What Google suggests you should use is Dagger 2. I think most of you are familiar with that. In, in my example, I will give you the GitHub link later. Um, I use Codein which is a, a, a nice little dependency injection framework for Kotlin exclusively. So I guess you can all also use it from Java, but you don't get, uh, you get the most benefit of it if it's, if it's in uh, Kotlin. And the difference between the two is that, uh, so um, that Dagger works with a lot of, um, a lot of magic, a lot of, um, generated code while coding is, is a bit more straightforward. So the um, disadvantage is that you will have uh, to create providers for each, uh, for each class you want to provide through coding, but the advantage is that it's really streamlined and there's no magic involved. You always know what's going on. So I like using it. I didn't, I must confess, I didn't use it on a large scale project yet, but on, on small to medium scale project, uh, projects, it worked out quite nicely. So now we have our injector in place. We can um, let it inject our, our dependencies. So I have an adapter here for, for the recycler view and some input method manager to hide the keyboard. And I'm uh, injecting those uh, by, um, I'm using lazy initialization here. So the problem with an activity we all know is you cannot just initialize everything in the constructor right away, but uh, the activity has to be at least in the initialized state so you can get views and, and stuff like that. So uh, the lazy initialization of Kotlin can help you here. You could still um, define or do, do your assignment in the constructor, but um, the advantage is that it's only, it's only initialized the first time you use it. So when you use it the first time in onCreate, it's also only initialized in onCreate, but you keep your onCreate clean because you don't have to put all your initialization code there. So next uh, is our, our views. And as a little side note with the last uh, support, uh, library, which is still in beta. It seems like they made the nasty find view ID, uh, find view by ID at least generic, so you don't have to do this nasty cast anymore. And there are our other views, and now we can look at our on create. It's uh, so far, it's not doing much interesting stuff. We just set our content view, we initialize the recycler view. And now we're ready to, to create our view model. To create a view model, we need a, a view model provider and we can get this by a view model providers off. And the, this, uh, the, the argument here is, um, is a lifecycle owner. Lifecycle owner is just an interface which has one method. And this is get lifecycle to retrieve the current lifecycle and it's implemented by the lifecycle activity. This is a, a temporary solution. So as soon as uh, the, li uh, the activity components hit version 1.0, they will integrate it in, into the normal activities. So like, I guess they will start with the app compat activity and maybe with the next version of Android, they will also incorporate it in the activity itself. So far, so good. Uh, an optional, uh, yeah, you can use this life, uh, this view model provider if you have uh, only view model, if you want to instantiate a view model that has no, uh, no arguments constructor. If you need to control the constructor, then you can add a view model factory. So the advantage, another advantage of the view model factory is that if you don't have it in place, then your instance will be created via reflection. 
And this is especially slow for instance, new instance creation. So you might want to use this view model factory anyways. Although I th still think it's okay in this case if you only instance instantiate one view model and you do it while the whole uh, uh, activity is constructed anyways, which is a time consuming thing anyway. So I guess you won't realize the difference, but I would still suggest to always use these factories. So how does this factory look like? The factory, for the factory we again have to implement an interface that has only one method, which is create. And it takes a class and expects as a return value an instance of that class. So that's pretty easy. Um, I just check what the class is and then I create my view model through my injector again. And otherwise I throw an exception. So to put it together, we can now we have our view model provider and we can now get our view, an instance of our view model through the cl its class. So let's look into the view model. Ah, no. First, we can of course now use the view model. So if we add a click listener, for example, on the little search view you saw before, then uh, we essentially, the, we trigger search users on the view model and expect our data back at some point. So now let's look into the view model. Um, I'm afraid I have to repeat myself. So you have to implement view model, which has, is an abstract class in this case, and it has exactly one function, which is on cleared. So on cleared is called only once before your view model is destroyed. And it's actually not called when your activity is destroyed because of a configuration change, but only finally in the end when your activity is really finished and finally destroyed. So that this would be the way to clean up all the dependencies, uh, dependencies you have that might keep this um, uh, instance from uh, being garbage collected. So for example, if you use Rx, you, this would be the place to get rid of your disposables. And of course, since we control the constructor, we can you have um, a nice constructor injection for our dependencies. And we can now implement our, um, our search users method. And yeah, what we do is basically trigger the search at the repository. And now, we receive the data and we can have a look at how to um, bring this data back to the view. And that's what live data is for. So live data is an implementation of the observable pattern. And yeah, basically you can continuously push um, values there and you can observe the live data for changes. Uh, it's, it's basically the same as a Publish subject in Rx. So it's a long living thing. You con can continually push new values. And on the observing side, you get those values. And when you first um, observe the live data, you get the last value back if there is one. So let's look at it how we can integrate it, uh, these into our view model. Um, we have these mutable live data here. So we can actually change it. And we have uh, two ones for the list of, of GitHub users we get back from the web service and one for showing progress or not. And now we can um, change these um, values as we want. There are actually two ways to change these values. The first one is just the set value and uh, Kotlin just, um, the Kotlin compiler just transfers this to the property access uh, internally. So what uh, behind this is actually a set value function. Um, when you use set value, then you have to make sure yourself that you're on the right thread. So basically this is for updating your views and of course you have to be on the view thread. We're doing this here in our, in our, our Rx code by switching to the main thread before we, we call the on next. Um, but there's an alternative. So there's a second function between set value, which is post value. 
and post value will ensure that um, this runs on the main thread. So you can just uh, choose whatever is best for your use case. And the uh, thing about nice thing about post value is if you trigger it several times before the main thread hits, it's only uh, it only invokes the observer once with the last value. Okay, so now we're ready uh, to go back to our activity and subscribe to it. This is fairly straightforward, so we just subscribe to users and say observe. And observe takes again uh, takes takes two arguments. The first one is a lifecycle owner again, and you pass the lifecycle there, so the uh, life data is actually um, can actually react to lifecycle events. So life data is lifecycle aware, how Google calls it, and when your activity is is destroyed, life data will automatically remove your callback. So you don't have to care about removing the callback yourself. You don't leak. It works fine out of the box. Yeah, the lifecycle owner interface again. And the second argument is an observer. And it's again an interface with only one function, the uh, unchanged. Um, and you get the value. So what's not so nice for me as a Kotlin developer is that the value is annullable. So I have to work around that because I almost never have nullable types in my apps anymore. Um, that's a little downside for me, but the rest is pretty straightforward. And of course, we have the same thing for uh, show progress. So now our activity is done, but there's already a small thing that I want to point my finger on. So we already produced some boilerplate. And imagine if you have five, four, or six values you want to observe, it, it, gets, it gets pretty messy pretty quickly. So I would suggest uh, to always have, to, to, to use a more single source of truthish approach here and always have one uh, data class that uh, accumulates all the data you want to pass and just um, use this one thing. Okay. Uh, are you still with me? Because I have uh, one more. So let's talk about lifecycle handling. That's the third component I want to talk about today. And um, yeah, what, what does it do? Before, before we answer that question, let's just have a quick look at our lifecycle again. And it, uh, the Android lifecycle contain, uh, co um, is composed of two components, which is um, states and transitions. So you have states and transitions that will lead to the next state, uh, um, state. So with our activity, we first start with initialized, and then our onCreate is called, and onCreate transitions this uh, our activity to the created state. And then we have on start, and we end up in on started. With on resume, we end up in resumed, and then we go backwards again. With on pause, we are back to on uh, back to started. So we are not paused, but uh, in the state started again. And on stop leads us back to created, and with on uh, destroy after on destroy, we end up in destroyed. So. Um, yeah, when we when we create Android apps, we of course uh, we want to focus on separation of concerns. And since the lifecycle is such a big thing in Android, um, we we just need a tool to um, to distribute these lifecycle events uh, to other components than the activity. And some of you might already have a mechanism like this in place. We certainly do. So we have some, some we, we written some constructs ourselves where you can just attach some lifecycle uh, event handlers to, to one delegate and so you get your, uh, get all your events and can you handle your stuff, uh, the stuff yourself. And this is what uh, the lifecycle um, handling is uh, and the architecture components is for as well. Um, so it uh, enables you to make your components other than the activity lifecycle aware, which um, yeah, 
which uh, which you can use uh, to to reach a better separation of concerns. So what? Uh, yeah, one thing you could. One other thing you could imagine would be nice in the future, there are a lot of libraries, like tracking libraries and stuff, uh, we all love them, and they always want to have on start and on stop delegated to them, so you could imagine they could just handle their uh, life cycles themselves in the future and would be not much nicer for us. Um, right now, uh, our activity uh, taken all together looks like this. And as, as I said in the very beginning, my first approach to Android ended up in huge, uh, more than 1,000 lines of codish uh, activities, which were really, really nasty. So um, right now, I'm trying to keep really all the code out of my, uh, my activities. And that's our activity right now. It doesn't look so bad, right? But um, how if it could look like this? I like this much better. Because activities, you don't own them, you don't instantiate them, you, you cannot really unit test them, and I would like to have my code unit tested. So what I did here is I extracted the GitHub view class, and this GitHub view class is a lifecycle aware class, and I'm doing everything there. I still have to create the view, of course, in the activity, and I have to set this view to my view class, and finally, I have to um, register my view as an observable to my lifecycle activities lifecycle. So how does this one look like? Um, yeah, we have our GitHub view and it uh, implements the lifecycle observer interface. This lifecycle observer interface is just for adding your view to the uh, to uh, as an observer, so it's it's a pure marker interface. It doesn't have any functions or something, and but yeah. So the first thing I like about this approach is you don't you get rid of this injector here. So you only use the injector once to create this whole view and all the other stuff, um, the, the injector is out of business and uh, is doing this automatically. So you have some nice constructor injection again for all your dependencies. You have to set the root view because you take uh, pull all your views out of this one. And in this case, we're doing it like that. So I just created a little helper function to get rid of some boilerplate code here. And yeah, we can come to the interesting part, which is how do you handle lifecycle events here. So you can annotate any public function in this uh, class with the add uh, on lifecycle event annotation. And this takes one parameter, which states which um, transition you want to handle here, which event you want to handle here. In this case, it's on create. The function, its name is on create, but it can be any name. And it must not have any parameter. So, in fact, there are two options. Uh, one is the zero par parameter function. And optionally, you can have the lifecycle owner as a parameter. So you can access the lifecycle from there again. And we will also need it in a uh, second. But what, it also, um, what it's also good for, as I said, there's the distinction between states and transitions into states. So the lifecycle uh, en uh, uh, enables you to check what the current state is actually. And you can either check directly, like here, if it's started, or you can say it's, if it's at least created. So uh, this would, be, would uh, be true for uh, created, of course, but also for started and resumed. But back to our uh, back to our example. So we're initializing the recycler view again. We're setting our on click listener, and we uh, register our observe uh, our uh, re register to the um, to the live data from the view model. So that's quite uh, the same code from the activity. All uh, just that it's not in the activity, and we need the lifecycle owner here again. As mentioned, you can um, just reach it into that function. 
So what can we do as well? Um, we can have several functions for the same uh, for the same transition. So in this case, I just separated everything uh, everything out again. So I have one function for the init recycler view, one to init the search view, and one to start uh, observing the thing. Um, I like this quite a lot, but uh, you can decide for yourself. What what you can cannot do is um, have one function um, receiving several events. So the on lifecycle event annotation is exclusive for a function, and you can only um, have one parameter there. So now we we talked a lot about MVVM. I think a lot of people still using MVP. Who's using MVP? Okay. As I said, a lot. Um, how can you use life si uh, th these architecture components in MVP? I think you're kind of out of luck um, concerning the view model and the life data. Because the life data, it's, it's pretty obvious because it's just another approach. You, you uh, pull the data out of the view model and with, MVV, uh, with MVP you push the data into the view via an interface. And that's also the reason why the, the, why the view model thing is not really working. I mean, you could think of just having your presenter implement view model to uh, make it live longer, but then you still have this, um, this uh, dependency on the view, and although you hide it behind the interface, it's, it's still there. So you would still have to uh, somehow um, get rid of this reference when the activity is destroyed after an orientation change. What you definitely can use is the lifecycle awareness, of course, so just use it to, to move your code, to, to separate your code into uh, smaller pieces and let the components handle their own life cycles. And there's another point, so we personally are using data binding, so how does this work with data binding? Um, it turns out, uh, so, uh, it gave, gave me kind of a hard time thinking about it, how, how I implement these, how I get these live data into, into my XML in the end, which is kind of nasty because you, um, you need the life cycle to observe. You need this life cycle um, to observe the live data uh, and make the, uh, enable the live data to um, get rid of the callbacks on, on the destruction of the of the activities, right? So there's also this uh, observe forever function that doesn't take a life cycle, but as the uh, function name also says, it observes forever, so you have to take care of um, detect detaching your listeners yourself so you didn't win anything. But it turns out um, that you can just use observable fields in your view model because um, of course, you have the same problem there, right? You have these callbacks and your view is uh, um, observing your um, observable fields via callbacks and you have to clean it up. But it turns out that you don't have to because they are weak references. So you can just use the view model with observable fields as well. Uh, apart from that, the problem is that um, live data is still in beta and when it will reach 1.0, um, the data binding team will also make their the data binding life cycle where somehow they didn't have any details on that yet but it will come but if you want to use it now I would suggest to just use observable fields. Yeah just to sum it up a bit as I, uh, I, I mentioned it already life cycle components are still in beta it feels uh, quite stable to me and it's it's nice um, to play, it, play around with it. I used it in smaller projects and didn't have any problems with it. But of course, uh, the devil is always in the details. So if you have a bigger um, project, you will s maybe run into issues. Um, so you will probably want to wait until it's stable. But I can definitely recommend playing around with it if you're interested. Um, the good thing about, life si uh, about these uh, um, these architecture components is that they are designed to work on their own. So you don't have to uh, 
take the whole package, but you can just pick what, what suits your use case best. So maybe you will just use Room because it's a very nice OR ORM. Or maybe you will just um, use these uh, lifecycle awareness to improve your code. And probably you can also take the whole package, just however, whatever floats your boat. Yeah. And I guess that's it from me. Do we have time for questions? Yeah. So thanks for, to Henrik Kokocinski. If you have any questions, please, uh, it's difficult. I can approach you the microphone, or if you can grab it. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so first of all, thank you for the talk. I think that you covered in a pretty crystal way the topic. So really, thank you for the awesome talk. <clears throat> I was curious about how did you handle the temporary displaying of views like Toast using the live data? Because uh, we had these issues like you use the <clears throat> the live data to display also a temporary status like a toast, then you rotate the screen, and your status is clearly that you are displaying a toast. So I know that Google uh, pushed an example using the single lives, live data thingy, but it, I, I didn't like it at all. So I'm curious. Mm, I, I didn't think about it yet, I must confess. So I was playing with, with errors, so like having an error resource ID or whatever. In, in your state and just showing a snack bar if, if, if you receive this one. But yeah, after the orientation change, you have to clear it somehow. So yeah, uh, I don't have a solution for that, okay. unfortunately. OK, thank you. I think um, yeah, I just wanted to give a warning. Uh, I saw this lazy and then uh, by lazy and then referencing uh, something in the, in, the, in the view, in the layout. Uh, it gets complicated or tricky if you use it in, in a fragment. I already did, it, did this, and then you have the reference to the view, and then uh, the fragment is not recreated, but the view is recreated, and then uh, on orientation change, for example, and then, um, yeah, you bind to the old view. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I have a question concerning how you save the instance state if you have the view model, then the view model holds all the state for the view. And if your activity exists because of a rotation change or something else, then you should have to save in this moment, but your view model lives longer. And the uh, problem is, if your app goes to the background and stays there, your view model didn't have the chance to save the state, and then it gets, for example, killed by the operating system, but the activity is not killed for being finished. It will get back if the user gets it back, and yeah. Yeah, that, there are certainly uh, several approaches to that. So for one, you could like always change your stuff when it uh, save your data when it changes. But I mean, in the end, you, you still get the on clear. Uh, on cleared function call when your activity is destroyed for good. So you can change your data there as well. Okay. One last question, maybe? Hey. Uh, so you said that you can annotate more than one method with the same on lifecycle event. Uh, Event. So you had an example where you had three methods listening to on create. Is there any special ordering in which those methods happen, or is it just random? It's it's kind of random. So you cannot really rely on the order in this case. And if you need this to run in a certain order, you have to do it in one function. Okay. Thanks a lot. And yeah, thanks a lot to our speaker.